that I want to bring in other kinds of ne'er do wells. But actually, that brings me to question one. Go on. Your magic origin story, when did it start? Oh, my teens. Uh, I guess about 16, really. Um, it was kind of odd. It was one of those uh, flash illuminations out of nowhere. You know, somebody just said something meaningful. And well, I yeah, what I said was, Jake, you've got the soul of a warrior, and I thought, oh, well, that makes sense. I understand what I've been up to now. But rather than go off and get more fencing classes and stuff, I decided to start practicing magic. It just seemed logical, and I picked up Paul Hughes and was mastering witchcraft the next day. So that was your first magic book. No, I first but magic book, and I still rate it very highly. Oh, absolutely, yeah. good start. Yeah. Mine were all. Um, the, the stuff you get at the edge of empire like there was a lot of Llewellyn around um, um, I had an independent bookstore who um, the, the woman who worked in it worked there for 30 years she's only recently retired but she um, kind of knew I had that exact um, uh, Israel Regatti um, Golden Dawn um, she got a second hand copy and it was broken down the front uh, it was 20 bucks and I was actually she saw me walking with a bunch of friends into the cafe next to it this was about 9 o'clock at night and she came out into the cafe while we were having dinner with the book and said, I think you'll like this. Uh, it wasn't my first one, but that was the kind of relationship I had, that sort of um, proper bookseller who she was aware of magic and not interested in it, but she knew enough to know which books were good and which ones weren't. Mm -hmm. So she'd get them in or she'd see them in a catalog and ring me up. And uh, Amazing stuff. But, yeah. um, so did you, you went out and bought Mastering Witchcraft? Mm -hmm. You didn't haunt a library and just... Oh, I have that? haunted libraries, but, yeah. but not for that. I ran about that same time I haunted Leamington Public Library and read The Golden Bow in four or 13 volumes. You know, so, I, yeah, I was a bit obsessive from day one, you might say. Nice. Because I've had to unlearn a lot of that stuff since. Absolutely. It was a good background at the time. And um, I, I asked the... Um, I asked Nikki and Julian this last night, but did you have any incidents of high strangeness in your childhood? Ghostly imaginary friends living mm -hmm. in a haunted house? Yeah, yeah. As I said to my parents as well, it's a matter of discussion, ghost people and ghost animals. You know. And, yeah, some of my ghosts as a, in my teens were definitely archaic. They weren't, you know, Victorian spooks. They were sort of ancient spooks you know, out in the wilds of Kent. So, yeah, you know, ghosts are nothing new. And, well, plus, I, I guess I was priming myself a bit. But, uh, you know, I got keen on Henry Treese, Rosemary Sutcliffe as a kid as well yeah. which is again sort of programming you to believe Robert, Robert Graves and, <laughs> and yeah, so on sure. so a lot of unlearning since but it was, it was good I've always been interested in mythology, Kingsley's Heroes was another one I used to read and then my parents got me Grimm's Fairy Tales which is rather funky Still, I've got a state of the art copy of that nowadays as well so once um with mastering witchcraft, did you do the? Did you recite the Lord's Prayer backwards? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I'll skip the scary bit. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I was you know, conjuring this beautiful Robert Carly within a few months of, you know, of getting into all that. Does yeah, you know, Idris Shah's you know, magic was a uh, was along pretty quick. Keir Solomon, I got pretty quick. And the White Goddess, which was influential for a long time, till Ron Hutton shot all that lot down in flames, for which I was deeply grateful. I mean, pulled mm. the intellectual rug from under me for a while, but it set me on a new path. And if that's not the traditional history of Western magic, what is? Yeah. Uh, hence, Geosophia, really. It was a, in a lot of ways a response to Ron Hutton's triumph for the moon going off and digging the real roots of Goetia and finding out some interesting stuff along the way. Research is good like that. You end up knowing more than you did when you started writing a book. Absolutely. Mm. Um, well, I mean, that's well and truly my favourite of the stuff. Haven't read Cyprian yet, obviously. That's well and truly my favourite. And I actually get more um, praxis out of that than, say, uh, True Grimoire because uh, it is important for me to know the sequence of how things have come down to us, whether or not it's... Not that anything has an unbroken lineage because people die and what have you, but um, 
it, it's important. Uh, I find it easier to access that kind of current, knowing um, where it came from, which I learned from the books. Well, yeah, I think Goethe uh, may not have been handed down from men mentor to disciple through all time, but it is a very long, continuous tradition in the West, which we've been very sniffy about in various periods. I mean, Mathers and Co. weren't, you know, used Goethe as a term of abuse, you know, same as the Renaissance guys and a lot of the Neoplatonist magicians, but it's been around since at least the, the late Bronze Age when it comes into historical vision and has evolved cont continuously. Theurgy drew upon it, you know, got, got all its practical nuts and bolts and put a philosophical overlay on them and so yeah, so, so Goethe is our tradition. Mm. Yeah, it's the West. It is the Western tradition of magic. M most of the good bits that have survived have survived, you know, in dodgy corners of the grimoires and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So you know, I find it a bit odd that since the occult revival about sort of 1875 or thereabouts, we've been inventing traditions rather than researching them and trying to you know, acclimatise them to the time we're living in. That's a uh, personal frustration point for mine as well. I think in general, um, Western magic's view of history, if not the history of magic, is still 120 years old. It's still the kind of things that uh, the Victorians knew about the Sumerians from... From Leonard from, Woolley and so Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And uh, what, I mean, this is one of the projects I'm working on at the moment, but what fascinates me is if you look at something like the Book of the Law, uh, book one of it has some very specific tech, for want of a better word, that the subsequent 120 years of, or 105 years of archaeology and Egyptology has borne out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are things that, and I kind of get the impression that, I mean, he obviously knew the book was important, but I kind of get the impression that Crowley had that awareness that um, there is something to this that you... Uh, that is important and old, but there was very little in what was understood of um, hieroglyphs in Egypt and whatever at the time to, to bear it out. And I find that fascinating that he managed to sort of, yeah, activate an old tech. And then we've then gone on to find um, some fairly compelling archaeological support for um, that world view sitting there at the beginning of dynastic Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, The trigger for the reception of the Book of the Law was the tiny bit of the Greek magical papyri the Golden Dawn actually had. Hmm. Now, you know, took two years running, p p performed the headless one in the Great Pyramid. Absolutely. Yeah, and the ritual has a life of its own. He might have wanted to show Rose the Sylphs, but yeah, yeah, the, the gods were, had something else in mind. Yeah. So ritual's not always about your intention either. <laughs> no, well, and that, but I think, I mean, obviously a bunch of people, the Rosicrucians and whatever, were sort of messing around in the King's Chamber for you know a couple of hundred years but it took someone with um, whatever your opinion of him it took someone with Crowley's skill to go in there and do that um, and I, I think he I, you know switched on the spaceship I think mm -hmm. it, it, that's what happened uh, well yeah, headless one's an authentic ancient ritual with with roots that go back even further it was, yeah. it was the right ritual for the job if, you know, if you've been doing some 19th century Victorian thing it, we may never have got the book of the law. No. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree. I, I, this is largely what some of the other research I'm um, talking about goes into. Um, so moving on from sort of reciting the Lord's Prayer backwards and mastering witchcraft, what was the next step? Has it always been... Um, has it always been a sort of lone wolf pursuit, or did you get involved with groups after that? It took me a long time to get involved with groups, and uh, it didn't last. But it was the right group at the time. Uh, I had quite a few questions which the occult scene weren't really dealing with at that time. It's like the only thing you've ever read about astrological magic was Pete Carroll saying it was rubbish. And I thought, well, yeah, it seems to be quite a lot of continuity involved. And I had a look at people like uh, Francis Yates and what have you because the, again you know, the academics were talking about occult stuff the occultists weren't but this group was actually using astrological magic and had some new ideas about it and some old ideas about it 
and they were growing their own herbs and making their own magical swords, even making their own paper. So I thought, yeah, I found the right group. Yeah, and I learned I learned a lot there. But I, I wasn't ever a particular particularly a joiner. And after after a few years and a few changes, I, I decided to leave and go my own way. And the interesting thing was, pretty much as soon as I as I left groups behind. I started publishing Hand Over Fist. It was like I'd been dragging these groups along with me and holding myself back. Yeah. So, so that, that was interesting. You know, suddenly the impetus was massively increased because I was only responsible for myself. Yeah. And the minds of my poor readers, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's on them, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so was that... Um, okay, so if... Houston was sort of mid to late teens was uh, group stuff in the 20s did you know yeah, tw- yeah late 20s early 30s I was involved with groups and about the time I was 40 I was, yeah, it got into suspended animation for a while and then the chief of the American sister group died and everything started up again because the, the Americans want, wanted to reconnect with us and get their credentials stamped and what have you so that woke us up again, and I got pulled out as the one most most able to go to and fro across the Atlantic. Uh, but that wore me out, you know, mm. uh, uh, along with various you know, personal things, personality things. You know. After all, that, I just had enough. Uh, it was a good experience, though. Got to perform conjurations way out in the sticks in New York State, you know, with uh, you know, no risk of interruption. Uh, Large groups of people and a ritual sort of put together over uh, uh, you know, properly over a period of days, rather than rushed in some scout high in England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah cool. Uh, the book that's coming out, uh, Saint Cyprian. What is it about, Saint Cyprian? Is it is it called? Um, that? There is a fair bit of St. Cyprian in there. There's a potted history of St. Cyprian. There's a translation of his confession, which kicked it all off historically. So, uh, And there's big chunks of, of some books attributed to him as well. But uh, really it's about the things he touches. Because you know, Cyprian's interesting. He, like, he's got his roots in the ancient world. You know, first part of the Confessions as he was dedicated to Apollo as a child and Apollo is like the patron of ancient Goetia then he becomes like a grimoire magician he is you know, author of probably as many grimoires as, as King Solomon as we're beginning to discover as we get over the, the Solomonic legacy from Mathers and so on looking to Spanish and Portuguese and stuff there's, and Scandinavia there's lots and lots of grimoire connections to Cyprian and then he hot foots it across the Atlantic and gets involved in the New World traditions as well. So he's got that three way connection going, which I find very interesting. And he's the only ancient magical hero who's really got that. So, uh, so I use him as a springboard for, for various other things. Um, I exa- uh, examine the spirits of the grimoires rather than the grimoires and the rituals. I think, well, what's the dramatis persona uh, something that's interested me for a long time has been under researched so there's a lot of ancient theurgy and hermetic stuff about the decans and the Egyptian decan gods and the later decan spirits of the grimoires which I think is where the four kings who turn up occasionally the grimoires come from okay and um, there's more detail on them as well lots more about the four kings whole chunk of practical hermetics, you know, the, the so-called low hermetics where you're working with stones and roots and, and stuff like that rather than performing mental mental rituals and so on. So, you know, so I'm saying, you know, you don't have to go off and do hoodoo, you can have a look at hoodoo and then come back to this old hermetic stuff and say, well, yeah, we've got these roots and herbs and stones and stuff, you know, maybe you know, this is Hoodoo thing can actually give us some idea what we're meant to be doing with these tables of correspondences that people have just been cut and pasting for centuries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, 
speaking of hoodoo, I asked, well, that's a, almost a leading question. Uh, what do you think is um, the key difference between the sort of uh, a magical world or uh, magical discourse from when you first started out, say, to say the first 10, 15 years, and what it is today? Well, some of the things I've been flowing the lone furrow with have become a lot more fashionable. Although I think there's a lot more to it than fads. I think people are waking up, becoming aware that the that there's magic in other countries than ones that speak English and have you know, read books written in the nineteenth century and since. Yeah. You can there's a, an occult scene, uh, a very healthy and vigorous occult an occult scene in Brazil, for instance. Mm where the African traditional religions, ritual magic, Kabbalah, yoga, all sorts of things have been being fused together for, for decades, if not a lot longer. And they've got a more mythological sense than us rational Westerners. So in some ways, you know, they're way ahead of the game. And we're becoming, you know, in the West, we're becoming aware of that. Astrological magic's better served than it used to be, although in some ways it's taken a step back and it's like, yeah, well, yes, you've got to do it by Renaissance rules or medieval rules. You know, you've got to miss out the outer planets. And I think, well, you know, actually, it's going to be good if we just did astrological magic and compared notes, you know, from our particular niches rather than say this is, you know, medieval is the high point of astrological magic, which in a lot of ways it probably was. But uh, there's a lot of Hellenistic stuff I like as well. Plus, I know from experience that the outer planets do have an effect. Mm. And the magical group I was involved with back in the day were into bending the rules and getting creative. Like, as Cornelius Agrippa and so on saying, oh, don't do stuff when the moon's in Scorpio. This group did a lot of stuff in the moon in Scorpio, <laughs> <laughs> quite deliberately. Yeah. And I thought, okay, what happens? You know, what, what's, the, what's the exact process? Yeah. So, yeah, being creative with astrological magic rather than formulaic. But at least people are doing this stuff, which back in the 70s, it was just Pete Carroll saying, oh, it's all rubbish. Probably because there was another group in Leeds who did, who did it and he didn't like them. I don't think he expected chaos magic to expand much further than Yorkshire, but, you know, people get this but landing in Los Angeles and think, oh, astrological magic rubbish, is not it? No, it's just this bunch of people Pete doesn't like. <laughs> when he was younger. <laughs> yeah. So to make that, I guess, uh, a macro observation, it's that uh, people are experimenting more with different things now. Stuff the early revival missed completely yeah. or got horribly, horribly wrong. I mean, made this says some positively racist and definitely neo-colonial stuff about, you know, the Negro fetishism being you know, working with lower elementals, you know, blah blah blah. You know, the, some of the stuff he comes out with in Abramel is positively poisonous. Mm. And, and it probably is only the last 15, 20 years we've been thinking, oh, African traditional religions. They're living traditions. We're only a revival. Maybe we could learn some stuff here. You know, sort of racial barriers have come down, and magicians have started to sort of do outreach. And you know, I don't advocate you know, becoming a Santero or, or, or whatever. I advocate, advocate having a healthy dialogue with these traditions in order to revive our own. You know, you know, you know like I saying with the, the Hermetics and uh, low Hermetics and Hoodoo, get some handles on some of the traditional stuff that's just been knocking around, not being used very much. You know. And you know, that's pretty much what I do. I mean, I've got. You know, cupboards and cupboards full of herbs and roots and stones and dirt collected from various unsalubrious places and <laughs> you know, as well as all this intellectual stuff you know, I like to get my hands dirty and you know, that's originally what theurgy was about you know, you know, Blickers comes along and says hey all you platonists, all this mental contemplation stuff is great but without some hands on stuff like the hermetics are doing making gods out of stones and herbs and things you know, you know, it tends to get a bit sort of world-hating and anti-cosmic. You know, we've got to bring spirit into matter. You know, Ian Blickers was a genius. I think he's probably the greatest of the so-called Neoplatonists. And like, 
I compare him to Cyprian, they're from very similar periods. Uh, Cyprian was like, uh, essentially a, a, a polemical creation of the Christians. And the people they were having a go at with this polemic were Neoplatonists and Theurgists and so on. Whereas the Testament of Solomon has been heavily edited to be anti Jewish, basically. Mm. It's a Christian polemic against the Jews, even though the, the original material is Jewish. Cyprian is more against the Hellenes, you know, the, the philosophers and so on. So uh, that's quite, quite a useful comparison. So, you could, same time that, that this confession comes out, Julian the Apostate is about is about to, about to die, but Neoplatonism is like the last great opponent of, of Christianity. So, so that's the period you can compare this. You know, all-powerful magician Cyprian with the very wise philosopher and head of the Syrian school um, who you know, also happens to be interested in magic and so on. Yeah. Cyprian is like a, a black magical pastiche uh, of the wise philosopher. I like that. That's a really good description. Mm. That's, that's cool. Um, I get exactly what you mean when you say that. Um, so then... Uh, astrological magic and experimenting with it. You think that's that's well, where we should a, be looking now? I'm not a great astrologer. I mean, that was one of the good things about working with the group. I mean, there were two or three people who were really good astrologers. I, mean, I, I know what a good astrologer is. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm not one. Yeah. Uh, like Trevor Langford you know, is a bit of an unsung hero of that period. You could just tell him your date, time, and place of birth, and he knew what sign was rising. Because he had like a three D model of the of the solar system running in his head, all he had to do was you know know the year and, and the time and place, and he knew, he knew what was rising. He knew where most of the planets were. Might have to do a bit of fine tuning on Moon, Venus, uh, uh, and Mercury, but you know often as not, he didn't need to do much of that either. Uh, yeah, you're a good astrologer. <laughs> I will never be that yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's proper on the spectrum stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. yeah. But there is cosmic consciousness and stuff to be obtained, even with fairly simple astrological stuff. You go out to the same tree, say, right, to do your solar adorations on a regular basis. In the course of the year, you'll notice you know, the sun sets a you know, slightly different part of the horizon. And you'll notice see the, you know, the sun and the moon are always in the same sort of band o overhead for in, in relation to your tree. So you say, oh, that must be the ecliptic then. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you know, if you're doing pentagram rituals or whatever, you know, you've, you've got this sense of your aura. You know, it's about three feet out. Somewhere. But with this knowledge of the ecliptic, um, I might have, suddenly your aura can, can expand out. And, you know, it, 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 you know, to, touch, to touch, touch the ecliptic, you, know, you, you literally obtain cosmic, you know, cosmic consciousness almost accidentally just by doing this little routine on a regular basis. And that's without you know doing astrological charts and like it's just you know, becoming aware of your environment, including the sun and moon. So I'm not, I'm not a great advocate for astrological magic because I'm not competent to do it. But I'm very pleased that there, there's you know, more serious work being done with it. In, in my period, I, I, I sort of approve in a paternal sort of way. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know much about Gobekli Tepe? Run that by me again. Do you know much about Gobekli Tepe, the um, Ice Age temple found in eastern Turkey about 20 years ago? I know it exists. Yeah. I know yeah. that whoever built it or last occupied it buried it yeah. quite deliberately. Yeah. And that burial took uh, the same amount of effort as actually building it. Mm -hmm. um, just bringing it back to astrological magic's um, recent historic underemphasis. Uh, this is one of the projects I'm working on. It's basically a star temple. Um, it has um, twelve um, smaller um, pillars encircling two larger ones, and the twelve are, I would say, patently zodiacal. It's, it's open to the air. They all have those cut marks on the top mm -hmm. of the two pillars, which would be up and down. Um, and it, there are carvings of animals like rams and scorpions and whatever so you sort of see proto-zodiac in it mm. it's that um i would consider it the hybrid place between um the neolithic shamanism you would see in lascaux and um this basically what mankind found in there was some kind of stellar teacher mm. so i think um astrological magic is an idea or at least entangling with the stars is 
um, criminally underemphasized. And I, I suspect that that was the thing. I mean, Crowley says it in Magic Without Tears. He's like, the most important thing to take away from this is that there are extraterrestrial intelligences, and he meant it in the pre-UFO sense mm-hmm. of the word, that are um, you know, trying to get in contact with mankind and potentially our future relies on this. And I think that is the... Th- um, I, I see that in Gobekli Tepe because they're south-facing pillars looking at Orion. It's a hunter's temple, um, and it's basically a, a sort of star womb on, on a hill. So it's, it's one of those pieces that I wonder... And obviously that um, compulsion to entangle with the stars then manifests in different ways culturally from um, that first point. But it, it, just, it does interest me that I think 2014 is going to be a year of stars in one way or the other. Yeah, it's hard to extricate magic from connection with, you know, well, for want of a better word, astrology, although astrology itself is a development along the way. I mean, before there was star lore and myth- mythology. Absolutely. I mean, it's in some ways, is more more interesting and more where we want to get to, but astrology is good structure. But they've always been interlinked, and it's, it's foolish to pretend they're not. Uh, oh, we don't need all that stuff anymore. Well, why did we need it then? Maybe we don't understand what they were doing with it. We mm. should at least not keep an eye on it. <laughs> I agree, and especially as it turns out, in the last fifty years, looking at even um, fairly pedestrian modern science, um, our our first observable religious impulse appears to be um, we come from there and we go back there, and then it turns out we do. Mm-hmm. It turns out by directed panspermia and the rest of it. Um, the, the, our, our first awakening um, as a fully modern species is this initial awareness and there's something about as you're saying because things like star law predate astrology there is something about thinking about the stars that either makes us smarter or expands our horizons or no I think so yeah. and, uh, and it's, it's this permanently compelling thing yeah we, we, yeah, we developed mathematics and a whole lot of other stuff out of interest in the stars, and we probably developed our brains in order to do so. Which yeah. would literally be, we had civilizing star beings give us the the tools of... of mm. uh, um, yeah, we paid them attention, it affected our evolution absolutely. positively. The, yeah. um, the um, Sumerian cattle and grain text has a mound called Duku uh, in the north, where um, wheat and farming comes from. Now. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is obviously directly north because it's in eastern Turkey and the um, genus of wild grain that is the ancestor of all modern wheat comes from the area so uh, it's I, I, I'm sort of fully with you on the mythology thing of either uh, mythology is an amazing way of um, finding meaning in the past and the present as long as you simultaneously take it literally and don't mm-hmm. and uh, there, there are pieces that come through uh, which I find truly compelling and um, I don't want to say it's a source of frustration but it's a source of perhaps surprise to me that uh, areas like this aren't of wider interest in the occult yeah, well people don't like being, being wrong you know, I find on internet groups you know, people would sooner not ask questions so you don't mm-hmm. think they're stupid than actually find something out yeah, so there's a lot of herd following goes on yeah, yeah. Kabbalah is important. Yeah, Greek mythology. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah, we've been doing generic Kabbalah for donkeys bloody years, and think we know what Goetia is. It, it's a book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, or, uh, rather than step out of the mold and say, you know, can we find out more? Yeah. Then has been regurgitated almost endlessly since the nineteenth century with a few elaborations. Yeah. And yeah, astrology is one, uh, uh, and star law is one major area. Yeah. Well, there are people who could do step outside the niche, but they tend to keep their heads down. Mm, true. Yeah. Again, you you may have that may be a very astute observation at that um, fear of being wrong or fear of the ridicule of the actually quite bitchy occult world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd think it's a modern manifestation, but then you only need to look at how often the Golden Daughters were in court and realise it's just... Mm. Well, I used to get this with even fairly modern systems. I was an exponent of English Kabbalah for a long time. I didn't 
discover it, devise it, or so on. You know, somebody else's you know, somebody else's baby. I just thought it was a damn good idea, and people should know about it. And the amount of hostility was phenomenal, and the amount of silly questions as well. Questions I'd never asked about Hebrew Kabbalah. You know, well, why is W three? Well, why is Vor six? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a system. It's producing results. Well, any system would produce results. Yeah, and this one is, so what's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, it was daft. You know. Well, it's new. We don't like it. But Talam is a new school. <laughs> mm. and, you know. But, yeah, things are gradually improving. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, a lot more positive stuff. Interest in the African traditional religions and hoodoo on the one side, interest in astrological magic, a new look at Goetia. Uh, th- yeah, things are yeah, definitely improving and fa- at, a fa- at a faster rate. I mean, faster than we can actually keep up, really. Because yeah. this material is deep. Yeah. I mean, not, you know, some of it we've not been pre prepared for. We haven't. Yeah. The old schools sort of saying, "Well, I mean, we haven't got a lot of the old traditional stuff, so we've replaced it all with Freemasonry." Yeah. And now we've got you know, now there's no room to bring this stuff back in because Freemasonry takes up so much space. Yeah. There is in my head uh, a perfect magical order which behaves almost like um, a fully funded research faculty or even a Kickstarter website where. Because you're right, all this new stuff is coming up, difficult to keep up with, and it's deep. And if you could just pod people off and go, come back in six months, you guys come back in six months with that. Um, unfortunately, it's it's hurting cats, uh, and I, I don't have the patience for anything to do with magical orders. But um, I agree. There's, it, it, I fantasize about a world where um, you could send pods of people to go, right, um, I, want, I, want six, I want six months for people... Uh, Doing like playing with Gobekli Tepe, go to Shaolin Alpha if you need to, whatever. And um, it, yeah, that's what I would do with unlimited money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, p- p- back in the seventies and eighties, there was the odd sort of donut, as they were called, coming over from America and f- funding a cult, a cult get-togethers. You know, getting the great and the good sort of drunk on champagne. Publishing the odd book that might not have got out otherwise, but that that seems to have dried up now. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, outside of academia, which has massively improved, you know, it's decided that magic is culturally important and started paying attention. Yeah, things are moving slowly. Yeah, yeah I, I had to sell most of my Crowley books and books on Kabbalah because you know, I wasn't reading most of them anymore and start you know, buying up books on Goetia and whatever from, from the academic world mm. you know, which I was actually going to read very very thoroughly and you know, they're, they're way ahead of us as, as they have been periodically before you know, like Francis Yates and so on with the Deccans and the Warburg Institute and all of them with the pick with the pick tricks and so on it took ages for that to filter out you know, into the occult world because the occultists weren't doing the research themselves by and large yeah. Or no, or being aware that the academics were. <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's that's true. And um, one of one of the things I've observed is that um, that very uh, Protestant work ethic, do the work, do the work. Um, you know, enchant until you're sweating. But I would consider do the work um, applies to do the correct research. This. Um, uh, a dismissal of anything with a whiff of armchair and reading academic books may well be it. It's going off in the wrong direction. If the, if the underlying stuff hasn't been aligned properly, then you can enchant all night if you want, but um, you're actually going to get more miles out of um, doing the research. Doing the research is doing the work. Yeah, balancing the two. Yeah, like, like I say, I, I like working with my herbs, stones, and, and so on. I've got lots of pestles and mortars and all, all the rest of it. I have to get the graveyard dirt out from under my fingernails with you know salt water and whatever, but that balances a phenomenal amount of research. You know, printing out you know, academic papers and you know, going down to the library to order yet another academic book. Yeah, you know, so balancing you know, the very practical with with the with the intellectual, yeah, you know, it's perfectly feasible. 
Yeah, and and a good thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It um, it puts the actual uh, practical stuff in in a wider context, which I I personally enjoy. It's nice to know that when you um, when you have something astrologically timed and you're pointing in the right direction and 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 you start a working, that it is tapping into something that's happened for. Um, if you pick the right one, thousands of years. Mm. Some Venus conjunctions seem to have been of interest to the Babylonians uh, and to the Mesoamericans. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I suspect there's some racial migration possibly explains some of the similarities between Chinese views of Venus and Mayan views of Venus. Yeah, but yeah, there's this whole, well, whole chunks of the ancient world connected to Venus with war as well as love. And that. Uh, uh, that's as true in Mesoamerica as it is in ancient China. So possibly there was some Asiatic migration to it, and partly explain that. But yeah, if you're working some Venus conjunctions, you're tapping into all sorts of stuff. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, it seems to be the cultures that first became aware of, of that cycle were the first ones to draw a pentagram on their pottery. Yeah. Because you know, the some Venus conjunctions a uh, 72 degrees apart in the zodiac, they gradually, you know, over a period of time, do a rolling pentagram, you know, moves a few more degrees e e over, over time. But yeah, you know, Sun and Venus meet 72 degrees apart you know, and trace a pentagram in the sky. And these cultures became aware of that, they had an advanced astronomy and started doing pentagrams on their pottery, long before it was connected with the five winds of Jesus Christ and mm. stuff like that. And potentially the sort of Adam Kadmon, perfected man. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I do. I, again, this goes back to it being underemphasized that um, uh, a complete, uh, a complete understanding that would have taken thousands of years um, of the movements of various astral bodies appears at the very bottom of the cultures that we can at least see um, beyond into the ice age. Well, past into the ice age, it might get a little bit more interesting, but. Um, the Sumerians showed up like that with a, a language isolate surrounded by people who speak other languages. Um, the highly developed metallurgy. Yeah. yeah, and then they started writing everything down like the devil was chasing them. Uh, and so it isn't even a gradual progression. There is something, um, yeah, uh, that I find quite interesting about that. And the. Yeah, you're, pro you're probably right. I mean, things like May Day and Halloween are definitely to do with herding rather than agriculture. Absolutely. And uh, in the in the north south alignment go go, go way back pre, pre agriculture. And north 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 south was the imp the, the important polarity long before east west was Absolutely. in tropical astrology. Uh, well, there's certainly Paleolithic survival mm. you know, all the way through our astronomy. Although and, and, and Goetia, as I say, comes out of the late Bronze Age and must have a prehistory as well as a history. Orion in Greek mythology has been, been prettified. I mean, a lot of the myths come to us in sort of classical coffee table form. Mm. Yeah, it's, but you know, it's, it's, the Greek culture goes back a couple, you know, at least a couple of thousand years, and, the, and the, those myths are just being written down. Yeah. How they how they were told in a more rural setting? Well, we know we know there we can do a certain amount of comparison. It was very different. Yeah. You know, to how it was told by the intelligentsia in the cities. So yeah, you get echoes, and Orion's a very interesting figure. And in Jewish mythology, he's connected with one of the fallen angels who's hung up in the sky, which is which is kind of interesting. You know, instead of being buried underground, you know, God, God punishes him by hanging him up in the sky, and that seems to seem, seem to be a bit of a theme with some of the angels. They're actually connected with the sky rather than the, you know the really infernal underworld. And the Jews are just turn, perhaps turning some of their astrological cult on its head. And say no, no, they're not star gods. They're demons who've been hung up there. But yeah, Sh Shem Hazai uh, is related to Orion, and a lot of those Jewish names don't come over into the grimoire. So there's like either like the, an equivalent with a different name in the, in the, in the grimoires. Uh, one of the chiefs, rather one of the kings, I suspect. But yeah. You know, that that law is bloody al archaic. Yeah. Mm. You feel that I think um, that what you're talking about uh, Goetia, if um, and this is largely down to you, but 
when you work with this stuff in a realigned way, knowing uh, or having a more uh, accurate vision of where it's come from, it uh, it resonates and it feels old. It doesn't feel um, it doesn't feel like you're wearing an ermine cloak in Florence, um, or and and kind of this very almost Shakespearean um, silly theatre of it. It feels properly old. It it, it feels uh, atavistic and. Uh, and I would say that you can almost use that um, like like dowsing sticks, you can almost use that to find when you're on the right track, when it starts mm -hmm. to feel really old, you go, okay, in that direction uh, yeah. yeah it's always always felt primal and old and, I, and I've usually been attracted to the bits that do uh, before I had an intellectual framework to put things in even uh, I was attracted to you know, this bit or that or that bit of the African tradition of religions, for instance. And as I, my, my vocabulary improved, I discovered that it was always the Congolese bits that I'd honed in on, whether it was in Haiti or, or Cuba or Brazil and so on. They're the elements that interested me always tended to be these, these black and red and fiery elements. Yeah. You know. Yeah, which are also the colours of, of Goetia, I mean, the, the, two, the two malefics, you know, Saturn, uh, Saturn and Mars, who flank the Secret Seal of Solomon, you know, their colours are black and red, you know. Oh, the really spooky bits in the grimoires, you know, Saturn and Mars, black and red, you know, it's like heraldry. And I mean, so that's always the elements that have attracted me, attra mm -hmm. and gradually I've become aware, yeah, Goetia is the old stuff. Or the fragments of the old stuff that have continued. Yeah, yeah. You, you you only ever get like a, a a fuzzy vision of um, of what it's going to be. It's it's just the reality of uh, archaeology and, and historical research, which doesn't bother me. I, I think if people want concrete answers, um, they're in they're in the wrong field, let alone like the mm -hmm. wrong subsection of it. But uh, it doesn't mean oh well, it works anyway. That that. There's a danger in the pragmatism of oh, who cares? It works anyway. Just do it. Mm. Which is you. Um, there's an opportunity to explore a greater meaning, I think, um, in 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 a wider ontological sense about who you are and and what the world is. Mm -hmm. um, if if you look at it this way, um, what do you think of Kenneth Grant? I'm getting to a point. <laughs> uh, yeah, I bought the Typhonian trilogy in the 1970s, about the same time Elvis died and punk rock started, and. I was interested in the Necronomicon and stuff like that, but pretty early on I started to notice that his history was incredibly dodgy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he said, oh yeah, yeah, Sumerian magic really important, Crowley said, you know, our task is rediscovering the Sumerian tradition, and he did, you know, the headless one's a Sumerian ritual, and I'm like, no it isn't, it's Greco-Egyptian. Yeah. There's, you know, some of the rituals it's related to might mention Erish Kigal, but only because he's been syncretised with Hikate. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's you reviving the Sumerian tradition, is grabbing the wrong fucking ritual from the wrong fucking culture, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, sorry. Like, yeah, his, hist his history was bunk. His history was bunk. Uh, and this is my two cents on it. His history was bunk because he had the same thing that Crowley did which was the stuff he's doing is new but he knows it's old and I think uh, Kenneth Grant was over ambitious in looking at the historical information that was available to him in the day to go well there's this stuff and there's this stuff ergo it's old um, it is old and, and we have more of that information now but the actual his justification is flimsy at best I, that's why I and thought I carried on recycling it yeah, true. true. It, it, yeah, there's no point in Grant's career. He said, "Oh, I got this bit wrong. I, you know, this is my updated opinion." Yeah, you know, so um, yeah, that puts me off. And he's also a pessimistic. Not well, he was a pessimistic Gnostic. You know, this world-hating thing going on. That, you know, well, the world's past saving, so let's just retreat into the mauve zone. And our fantasy there is magic. Uh, no, not for me. <laughs> Number one, even if it is lost, I haven't quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the the archons, whatever, are invincible, well, they're they're going to have to come around and convince me in person. Because yeah. I'm obstinate. 
Uh, I don't want to flee the world into the mode zone. Mm. And fantasy, fantasy isn't magic. Fant fa fantasy is part of magic. There's no, no, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't tell stories, and no reason why we shouldn't invent things. But at the same time, there is historical uh, truth. Now, ours is an ancient tradition, and if the academics think it's of enormous cultural importance, you know, we should be a little more proud of it and a little more into it, you know, rather than just inventing a lot of neo-Gothic bullshit. Oh, I would applaud right now. <laughs> I really would. Uh, actually, this is this is a good question then to to follow uh, on from that. So, you're talking to a beginner. Top three, like pieces of advice, or this, this, and this. A, a beginner who's been vetted and you're serious. It's not someone going, "Hey, I'm a bit interested in this," because then you send them in the wrong direction. People who have been vetted and uh, you can tell a serious top three things. Well, just traditional to keep a record, mm -hmm. preferably of magical work and also your dreams, um, and keep you know keep note of things that might be, and you know they might you know, your mood during the day and good good and bad luck and stuff like that, as as well as you know I did my pentagram at about twelve o'clock, because yeah. that way you might become aware of patterns and things like oh I, I seem to get this kind of result when the moon's in this kind of position and not so much when it's in that position uh, that sort of thing can be just helpful experience and you may end up noticing that you've got results that you didn't think you had uh, dream record and magical record both important uh, they, they deepen your memory you start recovering stuff that was otherwise have been lost. So yeah, it, it's donkey work, but it's it's very productive in the long in the long run. Another piece of advice is you'll often learn most from the stuff you're least attracted to, or even antagonistic towards. Oh, I don't like this uh, this aspect of magic. Oh, why don't you like it? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's putting you off? What are you resisting? Possibly, yeah. for instance, I know, I'm not terribly keen on chaos magic and so on, but I've worked my way through the curriculum twice, and well, the second time around, so I was uh, I was actually as a probationer with a mentor in the order, because I, I wasn't happy with the fact I didn't like chaos magic. Why can't I calm down about it? You know, what's biting me in the ass over it? You know? So you know, I went into it very thoroughly, and learnt a lot of useful techniques and, and stuff along the way. So yeah, go against your own grain occasionally is very good for your magical development, your knowledge, and you know, your practical experience and so on as well. You'll learn more. So you know, that's that's two. Unless you count dream record, magical record as separate. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, third piece of a uh, third piece of advice. Pick a do your bloody research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. Um, yes, that's a good one. And and research, I mean, hey, I, I write blogs, I like the internet. Research isn't only the internet. Uh, no, it's not even only occult authors. No. Yeah, some occult authors are very misleading stuff, gets cut and pasted over decades and decades. You know, that Mathers or somebody way back said, oh, you know, headless means without beginning, you know, it, you know because in Hebrew and, and so on, resh can mean head and it can mean start. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think you mentioned some other language as well, but yeah, sorry, a kephalos means headless, and there is actually a headless demon in the demonology of the day. Yeah, he was really quite popular, quite important. What did he mean to them? Yeah, but this, you know. Yeah, this false etymology just got recycled in pot boilers, cut and paste pot boilers over decades. And you probably still, it's probably coming out in a, in a new primer this year. Yeah, yeah the, 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 do the bornless right, leave the stomach. Oh, and by the way, it's called born, it's called headless, or born, because you know, bornless, that's bornless without beginning. No, no, it's a big, powerful spirit who can make things happen yeah, because other spirits are scared of him. Yeah. It's a totally different paradigm. Mm. You know, it's not some you know, Neoplatonic kind of process at all. You know, no Tao who art without beginning and, and all that. No, it's a different idea. Different, totally different. 
So reading academic works, being sceptical and critical of what occultists say, and it doesn't tie up. It hasn't got a bibliography, don't bother. <laughs> I, uh, good thing about Paul Hewson's Master and Richcraft, my very first handbook, it has an excellent bibliography in categories. Mm. You know. And he, he, although he's not terribly keen on Kabbalistic stuff, one of the categories is Kabbalistic magic. So, yeah, he's nice and open minded about that. And work your way through that bit of bibliography in particular. And, you know, there'll be a lot of good trails opening up. Nice. So that's three bits of advice and potentially a recommendation for mastering witchcraft as book number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.